Yeah, it's a beautiful afternoon. Uh, certainly what I would consider to be uh, the height of summer. Uh, let's say July 22nd, and we're back out here again at the uh, Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge here in uh, Massachusetts. Um, second time I've been here. First time I came through early in the, uh, well not early, but uh, you know, mid-spring back in May. This is some nice stuff, mostly out in the woods, nothing really in the meadow itself. And uh, today, I would imagine that flip-flop, most of the nice stuff, probably going to end up seeing out in the uh, meadow and wetland area. And maybe not as much interesting stuff in the forest, but uh, you know, I just got out of my car and walked out. And I uh, found something kind of interesting, kind of worth pointing out. We got a uh, orchid here, of all things, uh, coming up in the parking lot. And this is a uh, Epipactus helbrine. Looks like it's just getting started. And um, get up in that, get up in that flower there for you. Yeah, that's a nifty one. Is that the uh, the plinia right up there on top? I think so. So this is Epipactus helbrine, the uh, broad-leaved helbrine. Uh, another one of those orchids in uh, Epidendroidae, which is the uh, largest family of uh, orchids. Same family as that Calipogon uh, tuberosus that I looked at over in the uh, over in the bog there. And uh, this is odd because you typically associate orchids with uh, you know being rare or limited distribution, or maybe not always limited distribution, but be, being somewhat cryptic and elusive. But um, this. Orchid right here, Epipactus halberine, is uh, known for kind of being the exact opposite. This is not actually a, a native orchid to um, to the Americas. This is native to much of the uh, Eurasian continent, and it's got kind of a reputation as, d despite being an orchid, being a weed, which I mean is fascinating to me. I saw that this had been posted uh, up on INAT. In fact, aside from a Cypripedia macaw, which is uh, from a different subfamily of orchids, it's in the um, Cyproportier uh, subfamily there, uh, and it's you know seen quite often, quite prolific in the east coast of the United States, especially up here in the Northeast. Uh, this is the second most read, uh, logged and seen orchid on iNaturalist, and I, I guess I know the reason why now that I've actually looked into it. You know, got the labellum down there, uh, heavily modified petal structure, just like any other orchid. Uh, not sure. Yeah, these are the sepals that are on the outer edge. And, um, oh, yeah, I just got the, oops, just got the plenia stuck to me. Uh, which is, uh, and we'll, <laughs> yeah, that's what happens if that's all the little tiny microscopic pollen grains there. Orchids, um, have plenia, and I was going to get into this later because we're almost certainly going to encounter some, uh, milkweeds, hoping to see Asclepius incarnata. Um, but, uh, milkweeds, just like orchids, have uh, that plenia. So instead of having little individual pollen grains, they produce a little sack of pollen, which you can see right there. There's one, not the one I just took. And, uh, what they got to do is they got to take that to another plant. And basically, it just assures that that stigma, that receptive female part of whatever the next plant that it flies to, just gets a, uh, you know, doused in pollen, gets a ton of it, which is how orchids are able to, you know, produce hundreds of thousands of seeds per uh, per orchid fruit. So anyway, we won't spend too much time on this guy. I didn't even realize that that was such a thing as an invasive orchid. They're so, you know, usually so need some pretty specific soil, soil uh, biota to get going. But uh, yeah, we'll take a picture of this guy. Yeah, um, only actually logged from this site once, so I'll log it on iNaturalist so they know it's here. I, I don't believe these are actually invasive. I think that they're just common and uh, naturalized. Weird, weird story there, though. Just, um, you know, it, I guess it makes sense, though. You know, orchids are so successful, they're so broadly distributed. It, it does actually, now that I say that out loud, make sense that one could hop from, you know, Europe to the east coast of America um, without too much trouble. You know, maybe it's generalist with the soil, uh, mycorrhiza. Um, who, who knows? Certainly not me. And I'm making a fool out of myself by pretending I have any sort of, um, you know, any sort of profound or detailed knowledge about exactly. You know how this guy here. All right, we're gonna look at uh, one or two plants over there on the parking lot because I just saw Desmodium canadens and I just want to show you that guy again, and then we'll um, you know, we'll get to it. All right. Okay, so this guy is in the last video I did. This is uh, well, this one's kind of short. Got some taller ones over there. 
This is uh, Desmodium canadense, member of uh, Fabaceae, a tall, a tall member of, uh, you know, Fabaceae. And uh, I assumed it was on its way out, but it looks like it just kind of keeps sprouting and that it's, um, you know, looking like shit because it's uh, just incredibly hot. It's actually not too bad right now. They've got a nice breeze and I'm in the shade. But, um, you know, take a look at those papillinaceous pea flowers. You can see there's the, uh, let me get in there for you. Yeah, that's much better footage than we got last time. Get in there, see the, uh, the stigma there up top, that long thing right there. Stigma style. Down at the base, there's an ovary where you get the little pea pods. And then it's got the, all those um, fused. I believe that this does the same thing a lot of papillinaceous flowers do. So you get 10 anthers of which nine are fused and one is free. I think I'm getting that right. I'll I'll put a little note if I get that wrong, but I believe that that's what that's doing. A lot of peas do this, a lot of, um, or I should say papillinaceous, so Faboidae subfamily, remember? Or Papillinoidae, Faboidae, those are synonyms. Um, I, I usually say Faboidae, I think papilla, Papillinoidae is an antiquated term, but regardless, you would still consider um, this a papillinaceous uh, flower that is, um, you know, Fused banner, two wings, and a keel, modified petals. Um, you also get Mimosoidea, for example, in the pea family, which is uh, looks like a little pom pom. And then you also get um, I, I don't remember if this is they just have the three or if there's more now, but these are the big three that most people know. You know, Faboidea, Mimosoidea, and Sesalpinoidea, and the Sesalpinoid ones look like little you know five petaled uh, flowers. Not still zygomorphic, still bilaterally symmetrical, not um, really symmetrical, but, uh, not, not looking quite the same as a papillinaceous, um, flower. And, uh, do we get any pea pods already formed on either of these? Not on this one. Um, and then the other thing you'll note, you know, strongly hinting that this is in Fabaceae is that, uh, you know, segmented leaf in this case, uh, tripinnate, much like a clover also has a tripinnate, you know, thing going on. Oh, these, are these sticky? Oh, I can't tell if they're sticky. Oh, they've got like almost like a like a cat tongue thing going on. You slide one way, it's smooth. You try to slide back, and it's a uh, it's a little bit rough. That's that's interesting. The whole thing's kind of got an adhesive uh, cat tongue like quality to it. So again, we won't spend too much time on this guy. Although I think he's a pretty cool plant. You get some of the pea pods on this one. You see those flowers mature. They just fall right off. You get a little you get a little pea pod. Even the pea pods got that weird. Uh, like sandpaper texture to it. That's fascinating. Again, uh, we'll log this guy. We'll move on. You get a Sclepia syriaca here, a common milkweed um, with the with the follicle starting to form, gone to fruit. Um, that'll you know burst open later in the fall, uh, and I think that we'll be able to see a Sclepia incarnata in bloom, the swamp milkweed, and then I might they might even have one other. Um, one other type of uh, Asclepius um, going on here. And just, yeah, I'll show you right here. You got a, you know, you got a red clover here. See that? Also, also Fabaceae, also Faboidae. Got the uh, same exact tripinnate leaf thing going on that Desmodium does, you know. Um, Fabaceae, uh, much like um, Asteraceae, much like Orchidaceae, um, much like quite a few families uh, in the plant kingdom have some pretty you know, robust and easy to pick out traits once you learn the patterns of them. They might not always look exactly the same, but you'll see that they're merely variations on the same theme. All right, we'll get a couple pictures of this guy and we'll keep going. God, this video is already eight minutes long, but, uh, you know, we're looking at some cool stuff here. Okay, we didn't make it very far until we came across some stuff worth, worth pointing out. You still got Desmodium going strong along the path here, but uh-oh, who is this guy? If you walk right by it, you might not even notice this guy. But this is a, a nasty invasive species right here. This is a Lithrum, uh, oh geez, Lithrum, I, I can't remember the species epithet, but they call it purple loose strife. Now don't get it twisted. This is not related to any of the native species of Lysimachia uh, that typically go by loose strife here in, um, you know, the North America. I mean, I think you get uh, uh, Lysimachia in other places too, but uh, Lysimachia commonly goes by the name loose strife. You get swamp loose strife, uh, Lysimachia terrestris, uh, world loose strife. Um, 
whose name I can't remember. Liz Maki Borealis doesn't go by the common name loose stripe. It's called the star flower, but that's in that family. That's in that uh, genus too. And indeed, um, those are all nested within the family Primulaceae. This is in the family Lithraceae, and I don't believe it even bears um, a close or any relationship to uh, Lizomachia, but you can see it's got that same sort of uh, form factor that the Desmodium does. And indeed, I think the other day when I was out in that power line easement, I was seeing this a bit further back, not realizing exactly what I was looking at. Um, but obviously you can tell the difference because uh, the Lizomachia, I'm sorry, the purple loosestrife does not have papillinaceous flowers, nor does it have, um, you know, the tripinnate leaves. Nor are these leaves even really, um, actually, what does this have? Does this have opposite leaves? No, this has alternate leaves. This has opposite leaves. So, I mean, you look at it for longer than a few seconds, um, you can tell the difference. And, I mean, they do their best at controlling this here, but obviously some are going to sneak by. Um, up here we've got a button bush um, finishing up. And I was worried I wasn't going to be able to show it to you. But you come over right here, and we still have one of those beautiful... Uh, button bush flowers being visited by a honeybee uh, and this plant smells absolutely intoxicating cephalanthus occidentalis is the actual name of this plant but you can see why they call it the button bush um, pollinators love it. it smells amazing um, it's got readily available cultivars to plant so if you've got a moist lawn you should uh, or a moist property you should be planting some of this because it's beautiful pollinators love it it's a cool plant it's in rubiaceae the coffee family uh, and indeed if you you know you get in there even though it's a cluster of flowers they do indeed have that whole four petal thing going on that a lot of rubiaceous flowers have um yeah uh let's uh we're, actually it's got world leaves world waxy glabrous leaves free of hairs um yeah just kind of a kind of a neat plant and then to wrap things up for this section we got a uh, spiria alba which we saw the other day as well member of the rose family um, also kind of doing that tall stalked uh, branching inflorescence thing that uh, so many plants that you know seem to like this type of habitat do like desmodium and like lithrum uh, we're gonna keep going because we're seeing lots of good stuff and uh, we're not making very good pace I've barely even uh, left the parking lot to be to be to be blunt with you uh, ooh, nice oak oaksy oak uh, oak sap on there all right If it wasn't for all the uh, airplane noise in the background, this would be a, a perfect scene. There's no, there's nobody here today. There's like one other car in the parking lot. This is great. Uh, we get here. Is this that loose strife? Yeah, unfortunately, you know the pollinators do like the loose strife as much as they like the native stuff. You get milkweeds going to seed. You got a uh, apiaceous friend here. Um, I looked up some of the species. This isn't. Uh, this isn't Secuta like we saw before. This also isn't Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace would have hairy stems. Uh, I, I don't know how many how many variations on the whole white umble thing. I could tell it's not Queen Anne's lace. Number one, the flower head is a bit different, and I don't know how to describe that too other than the fact that it looks different. Actually, Queen Anne's lace. Yeah, you see these little bracts here. Queen Anne's lace is a lot more of those. Usually has a little purple flower in the center. Stems are hairy, and the uh, leaves on Queen Anne's lace aren't doing the bipinnate thing that this is doing. Um, APACA, I like the poisonous ones. I like um, the edible ones, but everything in between kind of gets lost on me. Uh, I'll take a picture of this and see maybe if INAT knows, but um, you know, I, I could find out if I really want to. I'll put it in the video. It's gonna, I'll figure it out one way or the other because I'm gonna log it. But uh, yeah, it was right about here. I saw a big ass snake last time too. I wonder if we'll see any snakes today. Obviously you get cattails typhus everywhere um neat but not something i'm really gonna spend too much time on because again something you can see pretty much everywhere and uh yeah let's keep moving <laughs> so all that out there all that white that's all in the lumbo lutea that's all water lotus which is a interest which is a plant that poses an interesting question and I think we'll get a chance to go see it later, but uh, really pushing the definition of what is and what isn't native. And what I mean by that is Nalumbo Lutea is native to the East Coast of the United States to about Connecticut. And we don't know, and by we, I don't mean me, I mean I mean people who actually research this stuff, not, not uh, 
you know, schmucks who are just, you know, just a casual, you know, take a casual interest in it. But, uh, you know, there's a question whether or not this is actually native to New England, um, because we don't know if perhaps, uh, you know, Native Americans, Indigenous Americans, oh, there was a turtle down there, had um, brought this plant up here to use as food. So really stretching the definition of what do you consider to be a native? Oh, there's some birds going at it in there too. Um, but God, that's crazy to see just a whole swath of them. And then uh, right behind me, uh, we got a uh, kind of roasting. I don't usually see this plant out in the open. Uh, roasting in the sun, you have uh, Impatience capensis, the spotted touch me not. Different from the other species of impatience, the pale impatience, because uh, this one's got the, uh, see that little nectar spur there? It's hooked under instead of pointing down. Uh, prominent spotting on this one. And then obviously it's got a nice orange color. This plant smells nice. This plant smells real nice. Um, looks kind of like it's getting roasted, but it also looks kind of like it's just getting started. Uh, now's the time of year for it. Balsam and ACA is the family on this one. It's another one I saw, you know, in the last video. That I was shooting. Um, you know, it's a cool plant. I just like, you know, a lot of people like how the flowers look. These kind of grow everywhere. It's really common. Um, and then, you know, if you don't already know, the reason why they're called touch me nots is when they go to seed, you get the mature seed pods on them, they just pop open at the slightest touch. It's a pretty cool plant. Oh, you got some saladago going off, covered in a what looked to be some sort of wasp or ant, I don't know. I don't know anything about bugs, but uh, certainly being visited by, uh, Jesus Christ. God damn it. Yeah, that's your moment of zen right there. You know, Asteraceae is the family on this guy. Same family as this plant right here, which I believe is Erigeron annua. Erigeron annuus annuum, something like that. Um, this one, of course, has the disc and ray florets. So you get the disc florets there in the center, which are the actual fertile flowers and the ray florets on the end. Again, this is a sunflower family dealing with the compound flower here. And uh, same thing on this one, although those individual flowers are obviously, or I shouldn't say individual flowers, the individual um, capitulum or capitula plural are uh, much smaller and more tightly lumped together. I mean, there's like 30 species of Saladago even here, most of them native uh, to the US and Canada. Not sure which one this is. We're getting into the season now where it's a little bit harder to key them out because early in the season, you just get a, a, a Saladago uh, gentsia, which is the uh, first one to bloom. But I won't spend too much time on this guy either just because I don't know. I don't know the exact species, but I'll I'll put it on Ionat as uh, Saladago because it most certainly is. Oh, hey, look, you got a... Uh... What appears to be two different species of verbena here. At least I think this is uh No, I don't know. Okay, so the guy on the... This guy here, I'm not too sure. Ah, uh, no, that's... Yeah, that's the other one. This is, um... Oh, Jesus. You get the... the they call it white vervain. So you got one species of verbena, and you get two species of verbena. A lot smaller... <laughs> Than I than it was when I saw it uh, over in that power line easement though. Verbena hastata right here, the blue vervain, and then the white vervain. A little bit smaller, more reduced, grow right next to each other. Two species of verbena coming up with uh, yeah, what I can only imagine is some kind of gallium, something else in the coffee family. It's got that structure, either a either a gallium or maybe a mint. It could also be something in the mint family. I'm not too sure with this one. This one I'm really gonna have to key out. But these two are definitely uh, two species of verbena. Growing much smaller than the last place I saw them. That's kind of cute. And I guess there's some bigger ones down there. And then of course you get the uh, you get the lotus there. I I'm holding off. I'm think I, I really want to hold off to do my lotus spiel until I um, you know I can get close to them. You know, actually walk up to one and show you what's going on. I was able to actually figure out that other guy. That's not a gallium at all. I was right. That is in the mint family. Um, call it a bugleweed. And this is another member of the mint family right here. This is actually probably the North American uh, example of the mint family. This is Mentha canadens here. This is a wild mint. Great plant. Um, 
you know, I don't know if it's, uh, let me show you those flowers up close. As you can see, it's got that same form factor as those flowers back there. It looks like what's going on there is you've got maybe two fused petals or something. To make five, I, I don't know. But uh, I, the flowers on this, once once I got up and I looked at it and I thought about it for a second, I realized what was going on. This structure right here is something called a verticillaster. That's the same thing that was going on on that bugleweed, um, you know. But, um, you know, just a cluster of flowers at the node here. Verticillaster. Just remember that word. Um, you'll sound, you know, all fancy. Oh, it smells like mint. That This thing smells amazing. Um, yeah, prob probably something people use. Uh, oh, this big fucker of a wasp right there. Jeez, he probably won't bother me, though. Um, but, yeah, Menthocanadens. Nice native mint family. Um, mints, for some reason, for whatever reason, I, I was misled maybe maybe i misled myself into believing that a lot of members of this family that you see here that are successful you know in the east coast are all from europe but there's quite a lot of nice you know common native ones that are you know just to treat to see because they, they're kind of everywhere this one i haven't seen you know many other places but now that i have seen it let me actually show you too i know what it looks like oh god leaves smell amazing and uh you know this right here that's definitely a gallium down there. See that tiny little, or maybe not even. I don't know. I think everything with tiny little white flowers is a gallium growing like, not even a vine, but growing like that, you know? Anyway, yeah, I came down near, near those lotuses, loti. No, that's not it. All right, well, whatever. Um, yeah, I'm, we're gonna, again, like I said, hold off on this for, just stick a pin in this. Um, a couple other things I would really like to see before, you know, uh, we get into, we get into Lotus and that whole thing. But, um, yeah, where was he? Where was he? Coming up next to a little, what looks like a little type of a ranunculus. Not going to bother with that one. But, um, I lost it. The bugle weed. Where'd my bugle weed go? Oh, here he is. Yeah, you can see that obviously, you know, has the almost exact same form factor there as Menthocanadens. But, you know, we're not going to worry about that too, too much right at this second. We're going to keep going because there's plenty more to see. We're not even off the, uh, not even off the little pathway here. Oh, you got a hyper come down there. St. John's wort. Probably perforatum. I think they get, they do get one of the native ones here. Um, I don't know where exactly, but they do. Oh, yeah, some of that loose strafe's really bad. Okay, I got to, I got to slow down and focus because I'm getting overwhelmed here. You get some sort of pee. That's nice. You know, got the got the tripinate thing going on too. Not sure which one this is. Eh, whatever. I'll take a picture. I'll put it. A lot of the stuff today. You know what? I researched before I came, but if I don't know what it is, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to live with it because I'm kind of limited on time. And you know, you read the descriptions. Actually, watch the video. Don't just listen to it. All right, whatever. I gotta I gotta hurry this up. Can you see the big guy? You hear them eat. That's that's the sound of them eating. There's a whole bunch down there. I believe is it a mute, mute swan? Is that what they're called? Oh, they're cute. Impatience, right there in the foreground. Look at the impatience commences. Got the swans in the background. God, they're beautiful. I just have the feeling one, if it was really determined, I just have the feeling that one could kill me. Man, this is a place, man, maybe this, this you know, if this channel was about uh, birds, this would be a place I'd spend a lot of time. They get a lot of really nice uh, bird action going on here. You get another one that kind of uh, tests the, uh, tests the boundaries of the native, you know, the whole concept of native you get a species of rudbeckia here i think this is rudbeckia hirta i think this is just a black-eyed susan you know a lot of people know this one uh and i think it's rudbeckia hirta number one because that's an extremely common plant that's been seen at this location i have rudbeckia trialoba growing up my house uh which is not as hairy and uh kind of irritating as this guy is this guy's really hairy hirta um this can take on a couple different forms so uh, i'm just gonna go Generally with Rudbeckia, which is how I posted it, and if people want to uh, look into that, they can. What the fatheries look like? Oh, yeah. Even the fatheries get those little stiff hairs on them, too, as they often do. There's the actual uh, 
you know, array floor, it's a disc floor, it's there. You know, Daisy Ray is on the outside. It's a all-American plant right there, and I guess Canadian because it's also found pretty much everywhere too. That probably cut me off. I've realized that when I actually change the um, focus on this, it cuts me off for like a second. So I said it's also found nearly everywhere in Canada too. Rudbeckia. Okay, now here you go. Here's a good one. Here's a real showy guy that if you've got people in your life that aren't into flowers, you take them out, you show them something like this, and bam, all of a sudden it's a bit more interesting. This is, uh, you know, a nice malvaceous friend here. This is Hibiscus Moshitos, the uh, hardy hibiscus or swamp rose mallow, whatever they call it, in the family Malvaceae, same family as cotton, as okra, as a number of other very showy plants. And this is, I mean, this flower, when it's fully open, these guys are just getting going, I guess. But when it's fully open, some of these flowers can be the size of my hand. And uh, let's see, does this guy smell good? Actually doesn't really smell like much of anything at all, but a beautiful, showy, giant pink hibiscus flower here. Um, like I said, Malvaceae, really, really distinctive calices. I want you to pay attention to that, all right? And the other thing I really want you to pay attention to are those uh, reproductive parts in there. So now how this is working is what you have are a bunch of anthers that are connate at the base, meaning they're fused at the base and they separate as they go up. And then there's that five lobed, yeah, five lobed stigma there in the center. All right. Looks really, really weird, but really cool. The thing's dropping pollen right off the side. I'm going to try and angle this guy a little bit more towards the light so you can actually see in there. Yeah, there you go. And these things get huge. These get planted in cultivation, although in cultivation they're less, let me actually zoom out so you can see, less stocked and more bushy. I mean, these were planted outside of the uh, outside of the golf, shitty golf course I used to work at. I'm sorry, shitty country club. I don't want to offend anybody uh, that I worked at. But the form factor is much different. That grows like a shrub. This is actually growing like, you know, a tall herbaceous plant. And hibiscus, or not hibiscus, Malvasi is a weird one up here. Lots of plants in that family do technically grow here. But aside from this plant, hibiscus mochitos, which is at the, this is not a rare plant. Um, we're just at the far northern extent of its range. It grows all down the, um, all down the Atlantic coast and swampy areas just like this. But um, the only other one you get is Tilia Americana, the American linden. And every other, um, every other member of Malvasia you're seeing is introduced in New England, either um, from, uh, geez, uh, you know, like the South. You get some of them that have managed to come from the South. And then you get some, like most of the Malvas, come from Eurasia. Just a similar, you know, summer hot, winter cold. And this is a cold tolerant plant. This is a perennial. So this is a tropical looking, tropical looking bastard. Give you one last look there. You know, that grows in areas that get, you know, uh, 60 inches of snow in the winter. Uh, you know, I, I was, you know, rolling my eyes at how goofy this plant looked in cultivation. And I mean, it does look goofy in cultivation. It, it, it even looks out of place here where it grows naturally. Um, and seeing it in person in its natural form, oh, the leaves are thick. Um, what's the underside look like? Kind of minutely fuzzy. You know, kind of puts it in a new light and a lot of plants you'll find that out if you're kind of you know not interested in gardening and plants in the garden you know come out and look where they actually grow you know i hopefully it's not just this one hopefully there's a few more stands to this guy but uh, this is where a lot of people seem to be looking at you know the fact that there's a little trail here and the fact that this is lit up on iNaturalist actually a lot of people seem to be picking this particular um, group of specimens here just to you know oh absolutely beautiful absolutely beautiful you know this one's wrapping up look at all the pollen in there holy crap um yeah malvaceae same family as uh you know this is a hibiscus uh, and it might not be for long apparently hibiscus is a uh, polyphyletic so this would be one that would not be in hibiscus i don't know if it would be in its own new genus or whatever but for now it's in hibiscus and most certainly uh malvaceous a lot of malvaceous flowers have a uh you know gynoecium which is just the fancy term for um, the reproductive structure, or put the actual definition of gynoecium there. But uh, you know, 
That's your that's your ten dollar word. Another ten dollar word for the day. But what a beautiful plant! Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plant. Look at that. You got a monarch butterfly right on the button bush. You know these guys. Oh, there he goes. Uh, those guys just made the uh, just made the endangered list. You know, really quite sad. Take a screenshot of that. I'll put that guy up on I I didn't get a picture of him, but I got him on video at least. I can just take a I can just take a screenshot from the video. It's it's fine. It's fine. He likes the button bush, much like all of them do. I like the button bush. Tried to grow some of these and I accidentally uh accidentally butchered them. But you know, yeah, you can really clearly see. You know, if you could just pluck one of those off and take it apart, you'd recognize it as a as a um, rubiaceous, you know, rubiaceous flower. It's got the pattern to it. Um, yeah, that's all. The button bushes get huge here. So I come down here just to the riverbank just to see what, if anything, was going on. And I spied this little tiny, this little tiny bastard here. And apparently, this is in the family Linderniaceae, which I had never heard of. And that's because it's one of the families that came out when they recircumscribed. Uh, Scrofulariaceae and Plantagenaceae when it was found that that was a polyphyletic. So I don't know much about this plant or much. I thought it looked like a broom rape, an Aurobankaceae. It's in the same order, I believe. Yeah, Aurobankaceae is in Lamialis. And this is in Lamialis as well. It's just got that look to it, you know? Kind of like a scrofe, kind of like an Aurobanky, kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, whatever the third thing I already said was. Scrofe, a scrofe. But, um, or Plantagenaceae, whatever. Whatever. They they, they, they re-looked at everything. I, I got the name of it. I just, I, I should have looked it up before I took a picture of it and posted it on INET. I had the genus correct when I, when it, you know, does the little scan. Uh, not an Aurobankaceae, um, but, but I wasn't too far off. I'm starting to recognize these patterns. But, uh, I didn't have any inter in interesting facts on it, aside from, aside from the fact that it's one of those ones that is a, re a new family. It's in a technically newer family of plants but it's doing quite well for itself um here on the banks of this river all that little it's all that guy all that guy did it again i gotta be careful with that when it zooms in zooms out but uh, i didn't see much else down here worth note cool little flower i've never come in contact with that family before but now i know it and now i know what it looks like so next time you know i recognize the pattern but um yeah we're uh, I don't think I'm going to find Asclepius incarnata because apparently I already walked through the spot where most of them are. And I think they're all already done flowering maybe. But we'll, we'll complete our walk around. Um, and yeah, now I'm looking down, there's a whole bunch of that little guy. Um, complete our walk around and then we will, um, we will, you know, if I haven't already... Well, I'll give my whole talk on the lotus and that whole story, why that's cool. And then, um, yeah, we'll probably get out of here. Oh, pickerel weed. I'd like to show you pickerel weed, which I've seen plenty of, just not, not close up. But we should um, think about wrapping this up soon. Oh, hey, look, it's Eutrochium. One of the Joe Pie weeds. I don't think this is Dubium. I think this is uh, Maculatum. I think this is the spotted Joe Pie weed. And I have no basis for saying that other than the fact that Oh, it smells so good. Other than the fact that um, that's the one everybody seems to be seeing from here. It does look different than Dubium, the one we were looking at a couple days ago. But, you know, I'll give it a, take a couple pictures. I'll give it a, give it a thorough exam later. Definitely Eutrochium, though. Definitely one of the Joe Pie weeds. They're all kind of hard to distinguish from one another, the three species we get up here. Oh, yeah. Plenty more of that hibiscus. Hibiscus mosquitoes. I saw some back around the corner, too. But, um, yeah, so it's doing, doing fine over at this end. That, that was the only place that it was growing, that one stand. In fact, these, the stand I just saw was huge. This is modestly sized. Okay, here we go. Last segment of this video. Apologies, I can't really get close. They got this platform here. Those pelt tape pads down there are the pads for Nalumba lutea. And there he is right there. Nalumba lutea, the American lotus. Again, I already explained. There's some question as to whether or not you can truly call these native to New England, maybe southeastern Connecticut, certainly the eastern U.S., but it's highly, it's suspected that these were brought up here by Native American tribes um, to be used for food um, because you can't eat those seed pods. And in fact, Nalumbo 
um, Nucifera, which is the Asian lotus, is uh, widely used as food. There's one of the pods right there that I'm talking about. Those are what they're using for food. If you've ever had, um, you know, I've had soup with that in it. It's quite good, although that might come from Nucifera. I'm not sure. Only two species in the genus, and in fact, only two species in the entire family, Nalumbo, Nalumbo, um, Nalumbo casei. I think that's how you pronounce that. But what's more interesting than that is uh, one of this is one of two species in the entire order Proteales on the eastern United States that's native to here. You also have uh, the American sycamore, which is a, a tree which looks nothing like this in form, fact, or whatever. Proteales, the order, uh, Proteaceae is in there. Um, Platinaceae, which is where the sycamores are in, is in there too. Nobody really knew that any of these plants were related to each other in the same order, at least. Um, I guess until somewhat recently, which blew a lot of people's minds, uh, Proteaceae, the proteas, are um, none of which occur native in the United States at all. I mean, they can grow proteas in California, but they're all native mostly to the Southern Hemisphere, South Africa, Australia, stuff like that. You get protea, hakea, um, you know, stuff like that, all in that, all in that family. But uh, yeah, one of only two species in this entire family uh, right here. The Lumbo lutea, which I find fascinating. Um, as you can see, it's doing quite well for itself here. Uh, again, all that is all just flowering. The Lumbo lutea. Earlier in the year, this looked similar to this uh, with smaller flowers. That was Nymphaea odorata, uh, white water lily. Then you also had Nufar variegata, the uh, pond lily. So plenty of aquatic uh, lilies. Of course, none of them are related to lilies at all, especially not, not this one. Um, uh, protea, you know, pretty, uh, sorry, proteales, pretty distantly related from uh, liliales. And then right here, just to wrap things up, you get a pickerel weed, um, Pontadaria, Pontadaria cordifolia. I'll correct myself, I'm rushing here, so cut me some slack. And again, I'm really sorry, I can't get you money shots on these. Uh, another weird one, because this plant's pretty much found naturally across the world. Um, you get it up here. There's a, Sag there's a Sagittaria down there too. See that? Sagittaria. Um, you get this pretty much around the world. Uh, you get it up here in the Northeast. Find it in the Everglades and the Caribbean. I, th I think of the Caribbean. Maybe they meant Louisiana and the Mississippi River Delta. You get it down as far south as Argentina, out in Europe. Just a plant with a really bizarrely wide uh, distribution. Um, and I don't have an answer for you on that, but I know that that's another, you know, plant that has quite a bit of uh, ecological and va ecological value and value as a food source um, for indigenous people. Oh, which indigenous people? Normally I would question you if you weren't specific, but I think we can give it the pass since this plant grows pretty much worldwide. The answer is uh, numerous groups of them. Uh, so yeah, we'll just close it out on a beautiful shot of this marsh. Canada geese wading through the uh, lotuses there and i always get to be careful when you say lotus because there is a genus lotus there's an actual plant called lotus but it's a uh it's in fabaceae um and it's a little pea that hangs out in the ground or at least a genera of small peas that hang out in the ground all right i gotta rush home uh this was cool i wasn't planning to do this um today i just randomly had the time to do it and um I hope this gets you excited. If you've got a wetland near you, especially if you're on the East Coast, if you get a swamp, wetland, you got to go visit it, man. you gotta, you got to go visit it. There's all sorts of great stuff out there in uh, wetlands. All right. Take it easy. Peace out.